In this week's video, we'll review relevant charts and data sets to help us answer the question. What do the history of bear markets and recessions say about the next six months? This segment of the video is being recorded after the close on Friday, October 21st. Here's some of the major topics we'll be covering. History of bear markets, recessions, the impact on earnings, counter trend and or major bottom scenarios, potential overhead resistance. If the bear market is still in place, what does history say about downside possibilities and when the final low may occur? We'll take a detailed look at the VIX during large stock market drawdowns. Look at a score from Friday's session. And for clients, we'll talk about fees. Last week, the title of the video used the term teetering. And this was really the key. The bulls needed something good to happen. As we covered in last week's video, stocks held at a logical area after that CPI report. Earlier in the week, we were still trading above and below the June low. This might be the most important thing early in the week. Significant U-turn in the UK relative to policy, impacting the credit markets and currency markets. We've had some decent earnings so far. We had a 90% update from a breadth perspective. And as we'll discuss thus far, the VIX has been fairly tame. Chart in the lower right quadrant of your screen is the S&P 500 as of the close on Friday, October 21st. Until today, we really only had one good looking session right here. And this is better than a good looking session. This is an excellent session. But on Friday, we got another good looking session, adding a little bit more credibility to this move here. As noted on Twitter, we've got some 9 and 13s that tell us to be open to either a counter trend rally or potentially a major bottom in the S&P 500. And from a psychological perspective, under our approach, we don't want to get caught flat footed or only on one side of the market, somewhat like the Fed did saying that inflation was transitory. We did take a very, very modest position during Tuesday's session and it's noteworthy. Friday's close, that session was still underwater and the S&P 500 on Friday closed below the intraday high on Tuesday. But still, this is a good look, and this is a good look. When we get these gigantic moves here, we still want to be asking ourselves, why would we be buying this market? And what's the time frame for a buy? To answer those questions, these four bullet points are still extremely important. A big development during Friday's session, the S&P 500 futures were down 30 some odd points in the morning, and then the Wall Street Journal published an article on Fed policy that speaks to this bullet point here. If you look at a chart, article was published at 8.52 a.m. That, for the most part, coincides with a massive reversal in the futures. It ended up reversing 127 points from the intraday low to the level late on Friday. This is most likely an article that was published with the Federal Reserve's blessing, and it's somewhat of a trial balloon for how they're going to approach the next meeting, which takes place on November 1st and November 2nd. History says that this is really what a pivot is about when they start talking about hiking versus pausing. And more importantly, a very, very firm pivot would be saying, we're done with the interest rate hikes for now. That's highly unlikely at this point, but a pause is not highly unlikely sometime in the next six months. The topic of this article really doesn't have anything to do with this topic. It has to do with the size of the next rate hike. So most likely they're going to hike 75 basis points on November 2nd. And they're talking about the possibility of raising by 50 basis points at the next meeting. And unless something changes between now and then, what's in this Wall Street Journal article will most likely mirror what we hear on November 2nd. And we'll talk more about this article and the potential implications in a few minutes. How about this bullet point? How do interest rates look as of Friday's session? It's the weekly chart of the 10-year yield divided by the S&P 500 that we covered in detail in last week's video. If you go back and watch that segment, it's very, very difficult to say that this is a bullish look for the stock market. This ratio is printing a new weekly high this week. You can see for the most part, looks like it's morphing into a full bore bullish look with blue, the fastest moving average on top, price above all of the moving averages, and for the most part, the slopes are up 
or at least flattening out. So this look here at the moment would say any push higher in the S&P 500 is more than likely a counter trend move than a major low. But that's subject to change if this chart changes in the coming weeks, which is absolutely a possibility. But this is the chart in front of us on Friday. If we're going to try to answer this question here objectively, is there evidence of a trend change in interest rates? At this point, the answer has to be no. This is the 10 year yield, three minutes before the bond market closes, 2.57 p.m. on Friday, October 21st. And this is the look of interest rates after the Fed plant in the Wall Street Journal on Friday morning. And as we'll cover in a minute, there may be a good reason the bond market reacted that way. How about the stock market? Let's see things look a little bit better here. This is approximately 3 p.m. Eastern time on Friday with the S&P 500 up 72 points. This look down here with blue turning up, possibly crossing red soon, price above blue and red. That looks better than what we've seen recently for the most part. You can make an argument this looks like maybe a counter trend move or even the start of a significant rally. We'll talk more about these levels in here later in the video. But to answer this question here, the S&P 500 is unequivocally still in a downtrend. Now, it's also important to respect that every market, including interest rates, are subject to counter trend moves. So what will we be looking for here relative to the market potentially going in this direction? If interest rates calm down in the next few sessions, that would be a good start. So you can see here in June, when the S&P 500 bottomed right here, rates peaked. But you can also see that the trend weakened before this drop in interest rates here. So at this point, it's probably fair to say the trend in the 10-year yield on Friday right here, this is a much more convincing look than this look in here that preceded this low in the S&P 500. But no question, rates have moved a long way in a short period of time. So a counter trend move in rates, or if rates peaked, absolutely could cause a sharp rally in the stock market. This is also an incredibly important topic relative to a major low. There are numerous cases in history where the Fed doesn't necessarily need to pivot. If the 10-year yield can just calm down and stop going up, that might be enough for the market to put in a major low. But that's not what we have right now. We're still making higher highs. Later in the video, when we talk about the probability of a recession, keep this in mind down here. Bull markets traditionally launch three months before a recession ends. Now, given what we know today, it doesn't seem very, very likely that it we're three months away from the economy improving significantly, but we don't know that. It's still a relevant data point. We've covered this in the past. This is also relevant walking forward. Now let's get back to the article from Friday morning in the Wall Street Journal relative to Fed policy that caused a 127 point reversal on Friday in the S&P 500 futures. Article was dated 8.52 a.m. on the 21st. Now if you read this article objectively, it's quite possible that the Fed is concerned that if they shift from 75 basis point hikes down to a 50 basis point hike, that they'll undo all of the good work that they've done relative to tightening financial conditions. And this article may be a trial balloon to see how the markets react. For the most part today, interest rates were pretty tame. Not so in the stock market. If that hypothesis is true, at the next Fed meeting, and we're in the blackout period now, so we're not going to hear from Fed officials next week on policy. Not going to hear from anybody on policy until Powell speaks on November 2nd. That's about seven trading sessions away. So it's possible, regardless of what happens at that Fed meeting, that the stock market's bullish interpretation of Friday's article will remain in place for at least seven trading sessions. That's one of many possible outcomes. One interpretation of this article is that the Fed is concerned that that shift is going to produce unintended consequences for them, meaning financial conditions will loosen again, making it difficult to bring down inflation. Interest rates, part of financial conditions, could come down significantly, again, making their job harder. And the stock market could skyrocket, 
making taming inflation harder again. This is from that Wall Street Journal article. If officials decide to raise by 50 basis points in December, they would have reason to worry about triggering another market rally. The equity market has been so eager to see pivots by the Fed. Fed officials have to explain that 50 basis points is still a meaningful increase. We'll cover this chart later in the video. Just wanted to show it to you as of the close on Friday, October 21st. We're still below 3,800 and still below 3,915. Here's the 1962 case. Here's the chart of the S&P 500 on Friday. Notice in this base, we make a discernible higher low. We have a discernible lower low we still have a base here. This is still relevant. The market is still moving sideways. Let's ask ourselves, does the market in here look more similar to the present day relative to the trend profile on July 30th, 2008? If you study trends, it's easy to say the market looks more like this period here than this period here. Having said that, the market wouldn't have scored very well on our scoring system here, and yet this is the major low. See this big reversal here? The big reversal that we had last week looks similar. So this chart looks vulnerable and weak here in 2008. The present day chart looks vulnerable and weak. And the 1962 chart looked vulnerable and weak here. It's also very, very important to keep in mind, the S&P 500 also looked very, very vulnerable here in January and February of 2016. And in this case, the market rallied from these lows here. And we know these scores moved from very, very low levels on July 8th to much more promising levels in August when we had all of those breath thrusts. This is last week's score, and this is what we look like today. This was done when the S&P 500 was up 75 points on Friday. The score doesn't tell us that the stock market can't rally. It speaks to the chart in front of us. It tells us the trend in its present form is very, very weak. And at a bottom, over time, those scores will increase in your risk reward ratio, looking out one to five years, typically improves off of this type of low. This is a good segue into client fees. We had all of the bullish signals in August. The scores were looking much, much better on August 16th. And the signals that were generated in here said historically, typically your drawdowns were very, very muted and performance looking out one to five years was outstanding. Didn't turn out that way. 93% probability is not a 100% probability. And as it turns out, this was our billing window right in here. So to explain what we're doing here, let's quickly go through some simple examples on our fees. Our fee structure is a little bit different relative to industry standards. They're designed so fees have a high probability of being lower during bear markets when there's less opportunity. But to simplify things, think of growth as stock-related ETFs and think of conservative as the position-traded money market fund that we have now, basically a cash equivalent. The quarterly fee on stock-related ETFs is quite a bit higher than the fee on the money market. Why? The money market's much, much easier to manage. So hypothetically, if you were in 50% stocks and 50% money market, your annualized fee would come out to be about six tenths of a percent. In an environment where the risk reward ratio has improved, and that's what we had in August, we typically have a higher exposure to stock related ETFs and a lower exposure to cash or bonds. So under this scenario, when there's typically more opportunity, the annualized fee is typically higher. And in the third simplified example, you can see this point right here illustrated. In an environment like October of 2022, when the market's making new lows, typically our exposure to growth is lower and our exposure to very conservative assets, especially in a bear market, is quite a bit higher. And thus, annualized fees typically would come out to be much lower. What we're going to do here is similar to what a natural gas company does to try to smooth out the monthly bill for their customers. The billing period that ended on August 16th, you can make an argument for a bear market, we could call that abnormally high. And our current allocation is much, much more conservative 
and we could say that the annualized fee there potentially for this billing period will be abnormally low. So what we're going to do to try to smooth things out is take the total fee from this billing period, the total fee from this billing period, divide them by two, try to get an annualized number for the two quarters that would look hypothetically something more like this figure here. One potential advantage for clients would be rather than taking out more money when the market's low down here, it's possible we're going to get a counter trend rally. We can smooth things out. We can take out less down here and spread it out potentially, allowing this money to stay invested during what could be a sizable counter trend rally. And if for some reason, if you're a client and you don't want to do it, just send us an email and we'll stick with the normal plan, which would be a higher bill in early November and most likely a lower bill in February of next year. One more important point before we get back to the charts. The smoothing applies to these two quarters only. After February 2023, we'll go back to the standard fee schedule. The information on your screen comes from Schwab. It does an excellent job giving us some historical perspective on recessions and bear markets. Let's focus on the graphic on the right side of your screen and walk through a couple of cases. These boxes represent individual months. This is where the bear market begins, this first blue box. The example we're walking through is the dot-com bust bear market. The recession is not called or declared until over a year later here. So there's an eight-month period here where the economy is in a recession, but it's not officially declared until here. And later in the future, it will be determined that the recession ended on the exact same month that it was officially declared in public. And in this case, after that declaration was made, the stock market took another leg down, had a significant retest situation in the spring of 2003. In terms of the definitions that Schwab is using, the bear market officially ends here. In the end of the recession, the end date isn't declared until several months later out here. Let's walk through one more example. It's the 2007 to 2009 bear market. This is where the bear market starts in October of 2007. The recession isn't officially declared until much, much later here. And after that declaration, stocks take another leg down. By Schwab's definition, the bear market ends here. The recession ends here in real time, but that's not declared until way out here. So one of the key takeaways is the recessions and the bear markets don't always overlap. The market's a forward-looking mechanism the bear market tends to start before the recession starts. By the time Niber announces the recession start dates, they have either been well underway or are already over. And the graphic allows you to look at all of the recessions and bear markets dating back to 1945 in the same format. Now let's shift gears to present day economic data. The leading economic index has fallen about 1%. Typically, it falls about 2.2% before a recession starts. However, the leading economic index is contracted for six consecutive months. Every time something similar has happened, we're already in a recession or one is coming very, very soon. We know as far as earnings and economic data go, the market tends to focus on trends. So think less bad or deteriorating. So back to the leading economic index, you can see it's been deteriorating in the present day. And these economic data points here, the trends are moving in the wrong direction. They're getting worse. We're not at less bad yet. And from a risk management perspective, this little piece right here is something that we have to respect. The Fed's current campaign to raise interest rates is the fastest, most aggressive in history. And thus, it's not surprising that the present day economy here shown in green is deteriorating faster than it typically does when the Fed raises rates. Remember, we said the economic data is getting worse. We're not too less bad yet. It's probably fair to say the same thing can be said for earnings. Every post WW2 recession was accompanied by a decline in S&P 500 gap earnings per share to the tune of 25% on average the median decline, 17%. There's going to be a lot of analysis of what's said on earnings calls relative to the future. 
You can pause your video player here, but this line right here tells us relative to where we are now, the worst is probably yet to come on the earnings front. Always good to revisit this information from time to time. So let's look at bear markets dating back to 1929. See where we are in the present day relative to history. The median bear market, when you don't have a recession, sees an S&P 500 decline of approximately 26%. The average decline when you don't have a recession in a bear market, about 29%. The average for all bear markets dating back to 1929, including those that were marked by a recession and those that avoided a recession, also 29%. The average decline for all bear markets, every single case dating back to 1929, 36%, which is larger than what we've seen in 2022. This table helps us understand how far the market could possibly fall within the context of history. So in the present day, the market peaked on January 3rd, 2022 at a level of 47.97. Hypothetically, if we experienced a 26% decline and it took seven months to reach the bottom, hypothetically, the bear market would have ended on August 1st of this year with the S&P 500 sitting around 35.50. If we look at all bear markets dating back to 1929, a similar projection would see the S&P 500 bottom hypothetically at the end of February next year, and the level would be approximately 3,100. The lowest low that we've seen, the lowest intraday low that we've seen is around 3,500. So if we take the historical data and the hypothetical projections into the present day, See a range down here from the table between approximately 2782 and 3549. Now the lowest that we've been on an intraday basis, right around 3500. Given the Fed is raising interest rates at the fastest and most aggressive pace in history, it would seem surprising if we didn't even enter into this box here relative to the history of bear markets. And we're not there yet. The highest level in this table would imply a close of 3550-ish on the S&P 500. This chart shows closing prices for the S&P 500 as of October 19th. And you can see for the most part, we've been hanging around 3600 on a closing basis. If you look at the table over here, there's a big disparity between the average decline in a recessionary bear market and bear markets that don't see an economic recession. And we know in the present day that the leading economic index is heading in the wrong direction and the trends in the economic data are concerning. Bloomberg has a forecasting model. Recently, it hit 100% relative to the odds for a recession over the next 12 months. And in terms of the expectations from economists, the odds of a recession just bumped up from 50% to 60%. If the odds favor a recession sometime in the next 12 months, means we should have a significant understanding of what that might mean historically. Again, dating back to 1929, bear markets that occurred within the context of a recession. The median decline in stocks was 39%. It took 16 months from peak to trough. The average decline 42%, also 16 months. If we use this historical data to project from the high in 2022 that occurred in early January, it would imply that the bear market would end sometime around April or May of next year, and the level would fall somewhere between 2780-ish and 2920-ish. Let's look at retracements because they have been helpful and they may continue to be helpful. The retracements on your screen from this A here, this is the COVID low here in March, to this B here in January of this year. On an intraday basis last week, it really came down and tagged the 50% retracement at approximately 3,500 and bounced violently. Chart on your screen shows closing prices only. The intraday level down here somewhere around 3,500. And you can see that coincides with a logical area of potential support as well. It's also good to know that the 61.8% retracement is at approximately 3,200, 3,215. And that lines up very, very nicely with our historical table. If you take all of the projections out here from that table and you look at the average S&P 500 level and the median S&P 500 level, right around 3,200. 
3238 and 3190. So from a historical perspective and a retracement perspective, it wouldn't be shocking at some point in the future if the S&P 500 came near the 3200 level. That's all to be determined. As we just covered, the recessionary cases historically say 2800 to 3000, also within the realm of possibility. From a contingency planning perspective, the 3000 to 3200 range is something that should be on our radar. Notice this range also coincides with an area of possible support. And we just said if the market's going to bottom in late April of next year, or let's say January of next year, it's not likely that it's going to go straight down to any of these levels. So let's walk through some counter trend scenarios to help us become mentally prepared. This is the S&P 500, about 11.30 a.m. on Thursday, October 20th. Key takeaway here. There's some potential resistance around 3,800 here, and then quite a bit of possible resistance around 3,915 up here, and that coincides with a downward sloping 50-day moving average here. If we do get up here around 3,915 and we test this blue downward sloping 50-day, the 2008 case can give us some context. So the same 50-day moving average here in 2008, you can make an argument we're in a similar window to this window where my cursor's moving around. Here, when the 50-day rolled over, we made a run at it. Really couldn't do much in terms of exceeding the 50-day here. And then we fell a good ways down to this intraday low and then shot up to the 50-day here and were rejected. So if the S&P 500 can clear and hold above 39.15, that would be impressive. So we make the assumption it's possible we could be similar to this window here from 2008. It's noteworthy that RSI in a daily chart of the S&P 500 really didn't clear 60 in any convincing way. This is 56 here. This is 59 here. If you look at RSI backwards here in September, the present day, recent level 55 fits right in that window. How is that helpful? Well, if RSI in the present day clears 59 and moves into the 60 level, it really starts to drift from this type of shorter term bearish script. And in terms of being open to a possible rally, we did have some really, really good things happen here. You can see this is where we rocketed off 3,500, the intraday low here last week. And then we have had some good breath data in this very, very short window here. 50 day as of October 20th sitting at 38.97. The 200 day up here, the downward sloping 200 day at 41.39. We just experienced a massive counter trend rally within the context of an existing downtrend. The history of downtrends and the history of bear markets say it's possible that we could make another run up to this level here. Not a forecast in any shape, form, or fashion. You can see volume by price says. There's potential resistance in this area here. Also potential resistance here near the 50 day. The other bars up near the 200 day. And to test any of those levels, we need to clear this 3800 level in here first. We've had trouble with that level for about a month now. Some other levels that are good to be aware of. If we take the retracement of this A to B move, so the peak here to this B down here near the low, here are the three blue retracement levels right here, here, and here. And if we think in fractals and look at this decline from A to B, the retracements are here around 38.55, 39.41, and just a hair under 40.40. So this table looks at average and median levels. It also makes sense to understand from a historical perspective something that's closer to a worst case scenario. It's always good to understand what's in the realm of historical possibility, not predicting anything. So we back out on the chart of the S&P 500 index. This is 2014 on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. This is the recent peak here in January of 2022. These are the same retracements that we've looked at previously. Intraday, the S&P 500 bounced here around 3,500. Can we think of a scenario where the present day bear market would turn into something as bad as the financial crisis? Sure, you can think of several scenarios. Here's one. 
with the Fed raising interest rates at the fastest pace in history, it's very, very possible that that's going to cause some problems for other countries relative to their currencies and their sovereign bonds. So we could get some type of currency crisis or bond crisis, and we've seen a little bit of that with the UK. They've had problems with their currency, and they've had some problems with their bonds. Thus, it's also helpful to understand if we do similar projections, but in this case we use some of the worst case scenarios. So the inflation-induced 73-74 bear market, the dot-com bust here, and the financial crisis. The average peak to trough decline in the stock market, a little over 51%. And look at the duration, 692 calendar days on average. We haven't even been going down for a year yet. And we know where the S&P 500 peaked in January of this year. Hypothetically, if we experience similar declines in the present day, and we also look at the average decline and the average duration, that's over here. Hypothetically, the bear market could end in September of next year, July of 2024, June of 2023, or November of 2023. Hypothetical levels, 2485, 2439, 2073, 2332. If we take the median of these hypothetical levels here, that's around 2386. So we take this number and this number, and let's just call it 2350. 2350 hypothetically would take us down somewhere in the neighborhood of the 2020 COVID low in the S&P 500. ARKK is down there now. Here's ARKK on October 20th. Here's the COVID low here. Wouldn't put any of this in a base case. And we really don't have to account for this case yet. Why? Because if the S&P 500 comes down around 3215, will already be in a defensive posture, and if it doesn't hold, there'll really be no reason to get aggressive at that point. And try to take it day by day and cross the bridges as we come to them. But if things really start to unravel, all of this is good to know. It's good to be aware of. It's good to be able to ask and answer, how would I handle something like this, this, or this? Let's talk trends for a minute. This is the 2014 to 2016 period. I can make an argument that this looks like a major topping pattern in the stock market. Price goes sideways for a long period of time. The 50 drops below the red 200. The 200-day rolls over. If you compare the look here to the look up here, there are some similar characteristics. There are also some significant differences. Down here, early 2016, the S&P 500 bottoms in February here. Now, prior to that, price is up near the 200-day moving average in red, and the 50-day moving average for a short period of time exceeds the 200-day. This speaks to the strength of the intermediate-term trend and the long-term trend. And then when we come down near the low, you can see we're really not that far away from the 200-day. The trend in the present day looks a lot worse. Look how far away the 50-day is relative to the 200-day when you compare it to the case that we covered in 2016. Moral of story here, observable evidence says this is a much weaker trend look right here relative to this point here when the S&P 500 bottomed. Another key difference between the two periods, right here, February 11th, 2016, negative interest rates could be coming to America. Janet Yellen was testifying and she said, we're taking a look at negative interest rates. I wouldn't take those off the table. Now, even if the market thought we're never going to have negative interest rates in the United States, this is still a dovish comment. This is the Fed chairman saying, yes, it's possible that we're going to be market friendly going forward. Compare and contrast this news story from 2016 here with this statement from a Fed governor, October 20th, 2022. We're going to keep raising rates for a while, night and day. Another chart dated Thursday, October 20th, this time 11.21 a.m. Eastern Time. If we look at this chart objectively, this move here, this was the big two-day move in the S&P 500 index. This little jump from here to here is the move in the present day. And as of the close on the 20th, it looks a little worse because this 22-point gain was reversed to approximately a 20-point loss. 
but even if it looked like this at the close, it doesn't really change anything. If you look at 3,800 here, what once acted as support, what once acted as support may now act as resistance. So resistance here, support here, support here, short-term resistance here. This move failed right at 3,800, and the current move, despite all of the fireworks that we've seen on a short-term basis in here and some nice breath data, thus far, as of Thursday, haven't made a run at 3,800. Now, that could change very, very soon. But as of this recording, at this point, we really have one really, really good-looking candle here. This was the intraday reversal off of that 3,500 low. This candle's not particularly encouraging. This one's okay. And these three are really in the discouraging category. In fact, this is the S&P 500 later in Thursday's session, 1.13 p.m. when we were down 14 points. This is still relevant. It says we should keep an open mind about a counter trend rally, maybe a significant counter trend rally. But the reality is we really haven't seen a lot yet. How about the VIX? Table on the left side of your screen. These are S&P 500 cases when we have VIX data where we had a decline in the S&P 500 of 19% or greater. On the day the S&P 500 bottomed on a closing basis, the VIX was sitting typically around 44 or 43. And if we look at the max closing price for the VIX during these cycles here where the market declined, max VIX, Let's call it somewhere between 40 and 50. In the 1998 case, the peak in the VIX came after the S&P 500 low. So if we look at this table here. In the 2011 case, the S&P 500 made a low on October 3rd of 2011. The max VIX level on a closing basis came well before that low. In fact, 56 days, calendar days before that low on August 8th of 2011. And the max close in the VIX, 48 in this case. And between August 8th, the day the VIX peaked, and the low on October 3rd, the S&P 500 only lost an additional, let's call it 1.8%. So this case where the peak came after, let's go down here and look at it this way. The calendar days to the low in that case is zero because the low is already in when the VIX peaked. And the additional loss in the S&P 500, zero. So just looking at the data in a little bit different way. On the day the S&P 500 bottomed again, the VIX was between 43 and 44-ish. You can see the specific numbers here. The highest close for the VIX, again, between roughly 40 and 50. And from the day that the VIX peaked, typically it took about 50 or 55 calendar days to reach the low. And the additional loss in the S&P 500 after the VIX peaked Let's call it four to four and a half percent. If history says the VIX typically will hit 40 to 50 ish, and we're looking at average and median levels, and on the day the S&P 500 bottoms, the VIX is typically sitting somewhere around 44. How do we compare in the present day thus far? Our max VIX close is up here around 36 and change. So we haven't seen anything in the 40 to 50 range yet on the VIX, and we haven't seen anything between 43 and 44. This is the 2007 case here. When the VIX is consolidating, so this is December of 2007, this is May of 2008, the VIX was trading in a range roughly between 17 and a half, and let's call it 32 and a half. Seen something similar in 2022. Here's 17 and a half here. Here's 32 and a half. Now, in this case, we got a massive spike in the VIX. The highest close was up here over 80. Specifically, the highest close was 80.86. Thus, from a historical perspective, the VIX is saying we should be open to additional volatility before this bear market ends. It doesn't predict anything. It just gives us some historical context to manage against. And if you know your market history, when the VIX is spiking in here, the S&P 500 is not performing well. This is max fear here in the financial crisis. It ends around November 20th or so of 2008 right here. The S&P 500 doesn't bottom until March 9th of 2009.
So walking forward, we're looking for a max VIX between 40 and 50-ish. And the day the S&P 500 bottoms may be around 44-ish. Those are loose guides, average and median levels. Well, there's no question that some good things happened relative to the bullish case this week, including the Wall Street Journal article from Friday morning that caused a big reversal. Regardless of how you interpret this article or the intended message, there's no question it leans dovish, which all things being equal, that's good for the market. Having said all that, looking at the S&P as of Friday's close, we're still on a downtrend. We haven't even exceeded this high here. This would be your first higher high if we can close above these levels here. And again, we didn't even close above the intraday high from Tuesday of this week. We were very, very hesitant to put additional capital to work when a trade that we made during this session is still underwater. Kind of a minimum standard for putting more capital in harm's way. Now that trade may be profitable on Monday morning. And you can see that's in close proximity to that 39.15. And we're still well below the primary trend line here. That's in close proximity to the 200 day moving average that we've talked about. So there's unquestionably some reasons to pay attention with an open mind and some reasons to be optimistic in the short to intermediate term. What that means to the longer term remains to be seen. We'll take it day by day. The Bloomberg article on the left side of your screen was updated on Friday around 3.07 p.m., meaning it took the Fed article in the Wall Street Journal on Friday morning into consideration. Someone being interviewed for the article noted that the Fed is not done raising rates and valuations are still not as low as he would expect to see at the bottom of a bear market, followed by the comment, we are just not there yet. The Fed is still raising rates. And relative to history, valuations are still not cheap relative to typical bear market lows. Whether or not we're there yet, that's for the market to decide. We covered this topic in detail in this week's video. And here's another article, October 16th, talking about the fact that valuations are still expensive. If we know market history and we're answering honestly, the answer to all four of these questions is still no. Is it possible the trend in the S&P is about to flip? Absolutely, positively, yes. Is it possible the intraday high in interest rates on Friday was the high? Absolutely, positively, yes. But we just made a new high. Haven't seen anything here yet, but we could see something next week. And we'll learn a lot more about this topic at Powell's press conference on November 2nd. In the context of everything that we've just talked about, long-term market history, the fact that we could be in the early stages of a significant counter trend rally. One way to answer this question, history says the next six to nine months could be very, very difficult. For example, a rally back to the 200 day moving average that fails and then the market drops down to either 3000 or 3200. That's difficult. To summarize, economic trends, unfavorable. Recession odds, increasing. We're dealing with the most aggressive Fed hikes ever. Probably have the worst in front of us relative to corporate earnings. The calendar says a stock low could come soon. Maybe late December, January, maybe early Q2. But still early even on that front. If we've hit the final bottom, because we hit 3,500 intraday, it would basically be relative to history a very shallow bear market. That's difficult to stomach when this is the case. A more typical low would come in somewhere around 3,200 hypothetically. That's where one of the retracements is and 3,500 is still relevant. Counter trends are 100% normal and to be expected. The odds of a substantial rally will improve if we can clear this level and a push to the 200 day moving average those odds would improve if we can clear this level. We're below both. Bear market rallies, even if we're still in the bear market, can be very, very sharp. That's a big move if we go back to 41.39. Have to keep an open mind about a wide range of outcomes on all time frames. Is the final low in place? It's possible. Don't believe at this point it's fair to say it's probable, but that could change significantly in the coming weeks. Make that evaluation based on what we see. The crisis case is not 
the base case, and historically the Vic says it could still get uglier before all of this is over. All five of these bullet points based on what we know today, fairly significant headwinds for the market relative to the low being in place. I have to respect that we're dealing with extremely rare circumstances, very rapid rate hikes in the context of an economy that was extremely strong when all of this started. And regardless of what happens in the coming weeks, it's extremely important to keep in mind, a low is significantly different from the low. It probably applies more now than ever. We all know the only way any of this works is if we had it the next week and every week with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities or any related financial instruments, nor should any of its content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates, or clients, may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.